Okay, so hello everybody and thank you very much for joining our live panel discussion today. Um, so over the next 50 minutes or so, I have a great panel with me who will be there to share their background and insights into AI with a particular focus on marketing and the benefits that it can bring. Um, so some of the areas that we'll discuss is looking at why now is the time to embrace AI as part of your sort of marketing strategy, if you haven't already. Um, we'll also look at then the power that AI has to really maximize the use of your customer data and obviously how it can help you align with any business goals that you might have. Um, and obviously, along with all of this, we'll try and add some great business case examples so we can really showcase the true benefits of AI. So as we go through, if you do have any questions for any of our panellists, then you can simply add those to the question mark speech bubble, which is on the right hand side of your panel. And obviously we'll try and get through as many of those as possible. Um, but I suppose a really quick introduction from me. So I'm Rachel Cotardia, the marketing director at Red Eye, a really passionate data driven marketer, but I'm just your host today. So um, I've got the expert, um, my panelists that will bring their expert insights and, and opinions um, throughout today. So I'll hand straight over to the panel so they can actually quickly introduce themselves as well. So Katie, if we start with you. Absolutely. Hi, Rachel. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to all of our uh, the delegates. I'm Katie King. I've been in marketing for over 30 years. I've worked with brands in every sector, lots of small companies, but also major entities. Um, and I've written two books on the subject. I did that because I needed to do my own marketing and to stay ahead of the tech curve. And the most recent one, let me just hold this up now, the most recent one was published in January of this year. So very fresh, all about AI marketing. So what I'll be sharing with you are my insights, but more importantly, the insights of various people from all over the world, from all different industry sectors, very much looking at how you can take advantage of AI in a very pragmatic way. I'm also on the all party parliamentary group for adopting AI and an editorial board member of the AI and ethics journal. So that's a little bit about me. I'm sharing more soon. Brilliant. Thank you, Katie. And actually, just a reminder, two of our lucky listeners today will be chosen at random to get Katie's new books, where we'll actually communicate that after the event as well. Um, so thank you. OK, over to Andrew. Do you want to give the listeners an overview of yourself? Hello there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Mann. Um, I've got uh, 30 years experience of marketing, um, but uh, 20 years of that um, have been in retail marketing. Uh, in, in sort of various leadership roles in places like Tesco, where I was club card director, Sainsbury's, um, where I was the uh, loyalty director working on Nectar, a marketing director at Co-op and, and a VP at, um, at Asda around CRM. So I've got lots of experience of, of uh, how uh, CRM and uh, marketing has developed in the last 20 years and how AI has changed that as we're going forward. Uh, for the last two years or so, I've uh, left retail and I'm now work using my experience and network to help clients understand how they can drive change um, in the market in their marketing. And that's why I'm here. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. OK. And then fellow uh, Red Eye employee, James. Hi. Yeah. So I'm, I'm James E, the head of customer success at Red Eye. Um, I've been working with clients for over 15 years to help them improve their digital marketing. Uh, my main focus is in marketing automation, particularly things like email, uh, SMS, social, direct mail, uh, and website content personalization. Um, I've got a lot of experience with AI around how we can help our clients target customers uh, and make it a lot more simpler. So around identifying opportunities within their data sets on an automated basis. And I'll be bringing a few sort of client examples to sort of today's panel and trying to bring it to life a little bit more. Fantastic. Thank you. Great perspectives, all different angles. So really going to be an interesting discussion today, I'm sure. So we're actually uh, going to start with uh, a quick poll, if we will, actually. Um, should be appearing on your screens about now. So, yeah, before we obviously get into the discussion then, I'll give you all a, a few moments or two to complete it, but we wanted to get a bit of a sense from you all listening um, in terms of, you know, your knowledge, your understanding, maybe your bit of openness to AI. Um, so obviously, you know, we want to know, have you considered or are you using AI in your marketing mix? So, you know, your answer could be no, you know, you never will do, you can't see its benefits, maybe not yet, you're interested to see how the benefit, how it can benefit you, maybe you're using it slightly and you know, have a few applications, or maybe, you know, yes, it's already part of uh, your marketing mix. 
So I'll just give you another moment or two uh, to collect some responses. Fabulous, I can see them all coming in now. So, okay, I tell you what, I will just close that now and share the results with everybody. So we can see, so actually it's appeared on my tiny screen. So I think the most popular answer is the second one. So that's great. So the majority of you are not using that yet. So uh, obviously, hopefully after the uh, discussion today, you'll get some insights. But actually, you know, to be honest, the majority, you might be using some small applications of it, you know, digitally that you might not even know about as well, which we might touch on later today. So um, absolutely great there then. Okay, so I think that's great. So I think what we'll get straight into is actually asking the panelists some questions and let's get, get going. So if I just uh, also show my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can all see us now like live and big. So let's start by then setting the scene. Okay, so AI isn't a new concept. It's actually been around for a very long time. And it's actually, as I was just sort of saying, already quite embedded in our personal or professional lives already. But it's now that suddenly everyone seems to be talking a little bit more red eye start at, so about AI, it's starting to come a bit more into the conversation. So Katie, if we start with you, so even though like I said, it's uh, been around for a while, why now is it suddenly uh, more of a topic of conversation? Yeah, definitely. Certainly when I wrote the first book and it came out in 2019, there was a lot of resistance and a lot of skepticism. The one just now, much, much more interest and demand. I think a number of reasons. COVID has definitely accelerated as we're hearing all the time that digitization. So we've been forced to use digital channels. Digital channels give us the data. So two main reasons you mentioned, it's been around a long time. It's been around since the 1950s. And all those times over that 70 years, we've had all these different, what we call AI winters. And the reason it's viable today is because we've got the data from many, many years of the internet and smartphone technology, e-commerce. So we've got the big data and that's what AI is. It's, it's the wrong term to think about artificial intelligence. Think about augmented intelligence. So we've got the big data and we've got cheaper processing power. So it's viable because it's viable. The venture capitalists have invested a lot of money and there are numerous uh, AI in marketing startups that are disrupting what we do, but also established organizations and vendors who have a suite of tools as well. They're the main reasons. Yeah, it's that explosion of data what you talked about, isn't it? That's a real, real key sort of driving force in this. So, James, then, I suppose then from the Red Eye perspective, we have seen this explosion of data, haven't we, from not only sort of digital, you know, native brands that sort of, you know, experiencing more data, but obviously those that have had to transform digitally from the pandemic. Um, so they all have, you know, far more data to play with now, don't they? Totally. I think it really follows nicely on from what Katie was saying, but... Um, common challenge the clients have faced is that there is data everywhere. Um, it does sound like a dream come true, but the reality is that it's often sensory overload. and It takes up a lot more time for us as marketers to sift through and work out what is going to be useful and how to use it. Um, AI has really exploded onto the scene over the last few years, particularly as Katie was mentioning around COVID and digitization stages, but it really just allows us to cut the noise down and end users to focus on a goal or an objective and that, that's where we're really seeing that explosion of data tie in quite nicely with AI for clients at the moment. Yeah, many can always see sometimes too much data as a, as a, as a challenge but actually you know it is an opportunity isn't it so um, and then Andrew from your perspective then is it just the explosion of data that has drove this kind of driving force in AI or is there anything else? Well look I, I think um, Katie's is totally right. Lots of data, cheap processing power has meant that um, people can use AI. But the reality is what people have started to do is they've realized that the techniques they've been using for hundreds of years can actually be applied into, into, into AI. So if you, if you think of, people think that data is difficult, but the reality is it isn't. If you go back and look, uh, Florence Nightingale was a data ninja. She used data visualization techniques to explain what was happening in the Crimean War back in the 1850s around what was happening. And actually all the techniques that marketeers have used in the last 20 or 30 years, actually exactly those same techniques can be applied to artificial intelligence about focusing on your outcome. And I think, you know, most people now 
they may not realize it but they're using artificial intelligence if you're doing anything on youtube or um, or facebook you're using ai in terms of what you need to get to so i think it's almost it's happening without you realizing it mm. but more importantly people are beginning to realize they just need to do what they've been doing really well and just apply it in a slightly different way yeah Great. and that obviously goes back to our poll results at the beginning when 83 percent of people think they probably aren't using it when actually there probably are some small applications but hopefully they can get a few more ideas off today isn't it as well so. exactly right um, okay, so we've covered that. Obviously, there's far more, you know, abundance of data around, which is perfect for AI. And you know, maybe then it's cheaper to sort of you know, also process that data, so we can do things better, faster, more efficiently. Um, which obviously has big benefits, which we'll, we'll cover a bit later on. But I suppose the question is then to the panelists, really, is like, why then hasn't it taken off? You know, there's probably quite a few misconceptions or myths around its use. Um, so, Katie, it would be great to get your thoughts on that and perhaps, you know, try and dispel some of those myths. Yeah, that's a really good question to, to analyse. I think one of the biggest ones is that you've got to have people on board you know to make it work the board the management team who again without being too generalist maybe of a certain age maybe you know my age and, and above um people need to be educated and to understand that this isn't big shiny robot coming and taking the jobs and making us all redundant um what i will add there is you know we're looking at the world economic forums report from last year there are 97 million jobs within the next two years that will be decreasing in demand, but 85 million are growing in demand. So, um, sorry, the other way around, so 85 million uh, decreasing, but 97 million growing. So we've got that net gain there. So, you know, what we're seeing here is this isn't the big shiny robot. This is augmentation you could be a barrister you could be a marketeer you could be an insurance person human being infused with insights so no longer as a marketeer are we having to be a, a soft art we can be scientific so i think the misconception is that, that it's taking our jobs and that it's scary and unaffordable and i think there's some of the myths that throughout this webinar we will certainly be able to dispel for you yeah, we don't want uh, any robots taking over our jobs, do we? No. Um, so then, Andrew, I suppose from your perspective, in terms of the industry and then market, marketers today, what do you see then as some of the myths or misconceptions? Well, I, I think there are two myths that um, I've debunked as I've worked with people like, you know, big retailers and boards of big retailers. The first one is everyone thinks data is difficult. You can see that sort of fear in people's eyes when you start talking about data and everything like that. And the second thing is, is boards think marketing's fluffy. You know, so two things. And so actually, what, one of the things I've worked through when I've been working with, with boards is I've, I've really spent a lot of time educating them on what the role of data is and how you can use the data and even getting them you know, understanding a little bit about coding at any sort of level, helping them understand what it is and how how, how it works. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, breaking down those barriers around data. And then the second thing is actually making sure they realize is that marketing isn't just a load of fluffy pictures. It's, a, it's very data driven. It's very commercial in terms of what it needs to do. And it's also very outcome focused. So, so actually working with marketing teams to help them realize that data's easy and actually they're not just fluffy, they've got to be commercial is one of the things you've got to do. And the second thing is get the board to realize that actually this is the right thing as well. Not just the board actually, one of the things we did at Marks and Spencers is we trained all thousand lead, the top thousand people had a two hour session on data and data transformation. So they all understood it, every store manager, and every leader throughout the organization had to understand it as well so you have to you have to start from the top down and then from a marketing perspective you have to build from the bottom up yeah. so basically everyone thinks data is difficult it's not everyone thinks marketing's fluffy we certainly aren't not anymore <laughs> yeah, definitely not no not the color and in department anymore definitely not data <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I suppose then you touched on it a little bit. So in a similar vein to sort of, you know, myths and things like that, then is barriers to entry. So like I said, we might have myths about its use or its benefits, but actually what do we then see um, traditionally as blocking, you know, marketers getting started or just businesses sort of getting on board? 
and you know a little bit carrying on from what you're kind of you know alluding to there you know markets be more commercial more data driven is there then do we think Andrew a, a sort of a barrier that marketers fear that they need to be more of a data scientist then to sort of get involved with AI I, I think so a lot of the time uh, the, the reality is um, marketing is an old art you know uh, and if you go back and look at what Sainsbury's did John and Mary Sainsbury's who set up Sainsbury's or or Jack Cohen who set up Tesco they really they they all started on a market stall and they knew their customers they were all local customers and they could make sure they gave them what they needed from their customers because they knew them all yeah now you can do that if you've got one shop but when you've got you know thousands of shops or you've got you know you don't or thousands and hundreds of thousands or millions of customers you can't do that so what artificial intelligence enables you to do is do what John and Mary Sainsbury's did or Tesco did Jack Cohen did at Tesco but do it at scale and do it at pace in terms of what you need to get to and data science it is is a sort of a way of delivering that and it's actually data science isn't a one person it's actually a team of people that need to be put together to deliver all against that. Okay, well, I think you know, I think you know, people may be thinking or worrying a bit about a bit of a scale of investment that might be needed then, which you know can happen as your company grows or your company gets bigger, whether it ever gets to the biggest the likes of Marks and Spencers and, and things like that. But actually, potentially, then the majority of brands listening in today. Um, a way that they can probably then start their journey or sort of get on board with sort of AI. It's probably then outsourcing it, isn't it, probably to start? Totally right. I think I think to, if you're going to set up, I mean, larger organisations need to probably, you know, you, a data science team will be, a, you know, three or four data scientists. It would be, you need data engineers, you need data managers, you need, you know, you need a whole team of people that can actually get any scale around what you need to do. And actually, as a smaller or smaller or medium-sized organisation, that could be a barrier because you know it's a big investment to make up front. So actually, the best way to do it is to find is to outsource the expertise around where you need to do and focus yourself on the outcomes. So you can be clear on what do I want to achieve, what are the outcomes I want to think about, how can I think like Jack Cohen or John and Mary Sainsbury's, but at the same time, I got somebody who can do that bit, and I can focus on what I'm good at as I'm doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And I suppose then, yeah. <laughs> and then so I suppose then, James, you know, we are technically Red Eye, one of those tech providers that can sort of, you know, help um, brands on that AI journey. But obviously, you know, even though we are that provider, you know, we, we do have those AI capabilities. Um, what are some of the barriers that you see some of our clients still having in terms of, you know, us getting on, on that AI journey? Yeah, um, I think the, the first one is not knowing where to start, um, potentially even starting too broadly. Um, Andrew mentions looking at the objective and that's sort of the, the key focus is come up with what your objective is and then start looking at how AI can support it. So we'll talk a few about a few examples later on, but it's really looking at what it is you're trying to achieve and then working backwards from there, basically. Um, thinking it all needs to be done in-house um, and not knowing what is available from suppliers in the market or that they currently work with as well. Um, so going back to the poll, a lot of people don't realise that the likes of Facebook, for example, or YouTube, like Andrew was saying, um, are using AI on a client's behalf already. Um, so you're probably actually doing a bit of it without realising it already at the moment. Um, and then we, we talked about it a bit earlier on, but not having enough or even having too much data um, it's really key that you start with the goal, build the model, and then start adding complexity. But start simple. Start with one of one objective or, or two objectives, and then build upon it from there. Um, and then I think the the other one is worrying about the cost, both in terms in terms of time and investment. Um, it's not as expensive as people think. You don't need massive solutions you can outsource elements whether it's the expertise side of things or just using models that are available in sort of your providers already for example so th those are sort of the, the top level ones yeah. that are the majority of you're right aren't you because what you have to do is you need to build your understanding and you yeah. need to get the, the, the business to come along with you if that makes mm -hmm. sense because if you know you, you've got to build your understanding get the finance director on board with it as well so he understands you and what you understand and deliver results as you're going so it's almost get some quick wins in and then one of those once those quick wins come in you've got more capability to build and do more of it when you get going don't ask for too much up front with no experience and no finance director will give you the sign off on it <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. But I suppose then people are listening, you know, are, are kind of thinking then actually, okay, well, how do I get started? What is that actual, that, that, that next point? So, um, Katie, what do you say is the, the best starting point? And I think you've got something that I'm going to try and get on screen for you while you're talking. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, again, like I mentioned, both books are about giving people lots of very honest, pragmatic case studies of successes and of failures. And in the first book, and it's still relevant now, I'm still using it day in, day out with clients um, from a training point of view and, um, you know, obviously speaking, but also workshops and so on and consulting. And it might be a, a, a media company, it might be a retailer, it might be somebody in automotive. And so I put together this scorecard from analysing all of the, the material that I'd, I'd learned from all of the case studies. And let me take you through it really briefly. So... What the idea is that you've got these 10 core areas and in a gamification way, you could use this. It's it's on the website. We can put it um, on Red Eye's um, website to download afterwards as well. You're able to give yourself a score of 0 to 5 across 10 areas and then come up with a maximum score of 50. Now, if you're scoring 35 and above, you're transformational. Anything in the middle there, 20 to 35, we're transitioning. And anything below that, and that might be many of our listeners today, because 70% of you said that you're not yet using it you might be having a quite a traditional approach to it. And the first one there is the mindset. It doesn't matter how old you are, you might be 50 plus like me, or you might be just getting started in your career. Or let's say you're in your 30s, you're preoccupied, you might have a, a young family. So it doesn't matter what age you are, but what does matter is that you've got the agility that you've got that open mindset and that's really important for the management team as well so you need the right mindset for change and you need the buy-in from the board stroke c-suite stroke management team they don't need to understand how ai works but they do need to understand its benefits its cost the requirements of it and then the most important one I'd say really, and they're all important, but you know, we need that business case. So we mustn't jump into this in a very tactical way thinking, oh, my competitor's doing this, I've got to do it. We need to really think about what problem will AI solve for us in our organization? And that could be um, offering um, products that customers want, um, leveraging our inventory, you know, personalizing our content and so on. So all different ones. Number four then is having done that, we need to do a proof of concept. We need to do a small experimentation. To do that, we need to collaborate. Andrew made that point there of, of the marketing team working with the tech and IT team because all of a sudden as marketeers, we are needing to understand the technology and HR and so on and so on. Six, and it's been touched on, is the talent. Are we going to outsource this? Are we going to upskill our teams? That requires us to have a certain kind of culture. We need to keep innovating. And then nine and 10 are important. We haven't got time at the moment to really delve into them at depth, but we need to know the impact of regulation and innovation and customer consent. So I work with TGI Fridays. And if you give consent to your retailer, for example, then they can give you a very personalized service. So no longer will they treat me in a very homogenized way and say female 40 to 55, they can say Katie comes into our restaurant, she orders ribs, she comes in twice a week, her partner's vegan, da 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 da, whatever it might be. And then finally that roadmap. So that's about getting started. It's thinking, I don't need this massive investment. I could invest in a small AI marketing tool for under £100 a month. Uh, but to do it properly, I need subject matter experts and I need to consider all of these factors. So hopefully that's uh, a few insights there just to get us going. Yeah, definitely. And everyone listening, and we can um, share this um, after the webinar as well, if that was of interest for everybody. But you can kind of see there, there's a lot to consider, really. But obviously, you know, once you, you start and you kind of, you know, have that conversation with the C-suite and you get your mindset in place and things like that, then I think, you know, there's definitely that all oh, that can be rolled there. Um, oh, sorry, Andrew, were you going to say something? It's really interesting when you look at this, because because one of the most important things to you know to really focus on to get to get going is the business case and it don't underestimate it because you've got to work out where where you want where you're going to spend your time 
a way you're going to do it. And, and there's actually there's two ways you can you can build a business case. You're either going to sell more or you're going to save money by using AI. There's probably only two business cases in any sort of any way forward. Um, most finance directors don't believe you when you're going to say you're going to sell more. It's quite honest. They don't because it, it it's it's not a reality. But actually, so one of my big uh, uh, learnings from doing this is identify where areas where you can save money. So actually, if you can find if you can find things that that where you can you can identify either costs in your marketing budget or costs in somebody else's budget that you can you can save by by using AI. That is a really strong way of of getting the leverage in terms of what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So look for savings, and then and then you you fund it by savings, but then you drive sales as as a way that you go forward for making forward. Yeah. So that's so the that big learning be, that I've taken. So that might be that ultimate end goal that you're trying to sort of you know sell in the idea of it. But actually, if you take a step back, then the marketer needs to sit there and think, okay, what do I want it to achieve, and how can it help me achieve my marketing goals? Um, so, you know, isn't that something that the marketer sort of needs to, to sort of consider? Um, mm. Andrew, do you want to take that one? Oh, oh, yeah, totally. I think, look, the, 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 the only reason you would want to think about AI is if it's a tool for getting you to deliver your goals at the moment. And your goals are either, you know, you know customer growth, you know, in terms of customer numbers or customer lifetime value or, or, um, or, or, you know, moving customers from trial into repeat or any of those other sort of goals that you might have from a marketing perspective. But I think, you know, the most important thing is to think, what am I trying to do? Almost, um, if you look at your personal objectives, what are your personal objectives that you've got that will um, help you, you know, help you grow as a person, you know, and, and grow in the business? Deliver your personal objectives more effectively through through implementing AI is a really simple way of thinking about this. So all I would add there is that you know our job, think about the definition of marketing, our job as marketing professionals is to satisfy customer needs profitably. That's what we're about. Without any clients, clients or customers, you know, we have no business, we go out of business. And I know McKinsey, McKinsey have said that, you know, if you when you use AI and you achieve positive customer experience, then you can boost sales conversions by around 15 to 20%. So I think, you know, that's a really important um, statistic for wanting to do. I agree with Andrew, you know, cost savings. But I think if we can uh, retain clients and grow them by giving them what they need and satisfying those needs, we are going to improve the bottom line. Uh, look, we're, we're totally right. One of, one of the phrases I've always used when I've been talking to teams in marketing is we want it to be better, simpler, cheaper. Mm -hmm. We want it to be better for our customers simpler for our colleagues and cheaper to deliver around what we're doing and yeah. so you know a really a really simple way that you can use ai and we'll come on and talk about these but it might be a good way of explaining it now is 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 often um you, you might be spending quite a lot of money on on facebook or youtube marketing in terms of those areas but actually what you might be doing is marketing to people who've just bought a product for example um so actually one of one of the really simple ways of having a better experience for customers, but also saving money, is to identify those customers who probably just bought a product and don't serve them an ad for the same product at the same time. And again, artificial intelligence is, a, and there's some very simple tools you can buy that will enable you to, if you, if somebody's just bought a, you know, a, a shirt or, a, or some clothing from you, don't don't give them an ad for the same sort of clothing at the same time. Give them something different in terms of what you need to do. And, and we found that saved about 15 percent of our marketing budget when I was at Marks and Spencer's by implementing that program. You know, so that, that was a lot of money for Marks and Spencer's. But actually, for anybody's budget, if you can save 15 percent of your marketing budget, you don't necessarily give it up, but you can redirect it to drive more sales. Yeah, definitely. that's a very simple ex yeah. example of what you can do. Definitely. I think some of the things you, you touched on there, your budgets are getting tighter, cost power acquisitions are, are going up, which I'm sure I think we'll cover a bit later and stuff as well. But customer experience, price isn't always the, the number one um, driver anymore. It definitely is customer experience. But, um, but going back to what you were just sort of touching on, um, you know, we were sort of saying, OK, the marketer 
and it really has to sort of understand what their goals are um, and obviously then we can now see then help um, showcase how AI can then benefit there. So I'm actually going to launch into another second poll for everybody just to get a bit of a feel. Um, let me go get it on screen for you. Okay, so here we go. So yeah, what is your most important goal of 2022? So as we were sort of just saying, you know, we want to kind of showcase that actually as a marketer, you can take that step back and go, what do I want to achieve? And then there are various applications um, of AI that can obviously help you achieve those. So just to get a bit of an indication from people, you know, in 2022, you can select as many that apply. Is your main focus to acquire more customers, uh, drive more repeat? Maybe look at sort of increasing that loyalty and VIP pop that you may have. Maybe actually it's focus on sort of churn or maybe driving customer lifetime value. All common marketing goals, but obviously at different points in different businesses, um, they might be focusing on a slightly different direction. So just trying to get a bit of understanding in terms of where our listeners are at today. Okay, so I'll just give it another moment. We've got a few of you that have been voting in, which is great. Okay, and I'll close that now then. And share those results. So quite interestingly, there's just the top two really. So acquire and repeat. So again, like I said, as I was just saying, you know, CPCs are rising. So you want to make sure that you're being smarter, I think, with your acquisition. Um, and then obviously retention is key. We don't want any business to have sort of a, a leaky bucket. Um, we want to try and retain as many of those as possible. So hopefully we've actually got some uh, examples that we can go through as well um, a bit later on in terms of some of the applications of that. Okay. So I'll also just uh, stop sharing the screen again. So hopefully you can see then all of those back on screen again. Okay. Um, okay. So I think now then actually is a really, really good time to then jump to the benefits of sort of AI. And again, some of these applications that marketers can get from it. So, you know, why should they be really looking to sort of add this as part of their marketing strategy? Um, and so Katie, if we start with you and actually mm. it's not just the marketer, is it actually? By the marketer using AI applications, it can have this really great effect on what we were just talking about, the customer experience there, Brandon. Yeah. Absolutely. And HR as well. So for me in the whole book, second book is about connecting marketing, sales and customer experience. And if you think of the internal customer, the HR team have a, a big role to play in that and the advocacy that a whole, whether it's a small team or a huge team. So I'd start really general by talking a bit, a little bit of jargon, but the three Ds, AI can do the dirty, the dull and the dangerous. So again, you know, in marketing is not so much of the, the dangerous, but you know, it's data crunching, it's, it's insights, it's making what we do much more scientific and then getting a bit more specific and just picking out a few examples thinking about the profile of, of the listeners here so um, um, Walmart for example you know it's about um, an interview I did with them and for them it was all about optimizing inventory efficiency making their customer experience much better Costco is another example and they're using machine learning which is a subset of AI in their in-store bakery and what they've done is they've actually taken the views of the bakery staff that they have. They've looked at the historical data of purchasing patterns, and then they've looked at other data. So big data about um, weather patterns or sport or holidays, plus those experiences of stuff. And using that, they can optimize and decide how much product to have in store and the type of products to have in store. So I think that's really important. And that is particularly with the green hat on, reducing food waste, you know, being more sustainable, giving people what they want. So tapping into those insights. And if you're a restaurant, and you might even be a very small restaurant, you could tap into that same data to understand with 90% um, accuracy how many diners are going to be coming into your restaurant. So again, cutting food waste, improving your profitability. m and I know have used um, AI for new product development, you know, to get feedback on what's working because ultimately it's about offering customers more of what they actually want so a bit of a paradox but the ability to offer personalization at scale and i see that happening in education and in healthcare over the next two to five years as well ai enables us with infusing us with the big data to be able to do that a couple of other quick examples it might be l'oreal and the cosmetics with their modif face might seem a bit gimmicky but you know, certain demographics of, of customers love it, allowing you to virtually try on those products, those cosmetics, those hair care colors, um, or 
using a serum being able to use AI to give somebody a very personalized your actual serum based on your skin type what you need and so on Mercedes-Benz the last example I would give um, and that might be sensors in the car and hyper screen using AI and using customers to be the advocates for new customers of the um, who might be wanting to purchase, for example, if it's Nissan or Mercedes, a new electric vehicle, and the ability to then use a virtual assistant, which is part of AI, for infotainment, for um, comfort in the car, and for data to be going by an area down a high street and say, what's that building over there on the right-hand side? So personalized information to enable that vehicle manufacturer retailer to be able to offer something that customers want and something perhaps that others in the market don't offer so they're just yeah. a few examples great good examples there and i've like all of those you know the data that you can get off the back of it and again the more data we can collect we haven't really touched on it but the machine learning element of it as well the more data we have the yeah. more accurate the more efficiencies the more scale you can get so um, exactly you were kind of ultimately touching on it there, but everything then and the AI was sort of helping in those examples was ultimately taking the guesswork out for yeah. the marketer, which totally. is you know, a huge efficiency gain. You know, who wouldn't want to be able to do things with less time, you know, less effort, but yeah. you know, achieve their greater success. And um, all I would say that it's really important because people that might again might be listening thinking, oh, but how do I, you know, what why is this relevant to me? If you don't take advantage of these tools now you, you know you basically can't afford to ignore it because you could a year or two ago you can't now because other people will be doing it they'll have a differentiator whether you're a small uh, business or a, a large you know large corporate you need those insights you need that differentiation you need to stay ahead um, and I think that's so important and I look at cloud and I look at what I've been doing with my accountant for 12 years it started very traditional then it moved to software as a service now it's got small elements of ai in it and if he hadn't evolved i wouldn't have used him for 12 more years because he's needed to evolve and that same um, next new way of doing things with new tools that we need to invest in i think is what the today's marketer has to think of really and that's what AI is just another evolution of, of those tools that we all have to do and I've moved in 30 years from very traditional marketing to digital to now AI and it's my only way to stay ahead yeah it can be that brand differentiator most definitely I think and um, James I'd like to sort of you know bring you back in now and actually let's sort of talk through some of the examples of applications that some of the clients at Red Eye can see a benefit from AI from yeah so Looking back at that last um, poll, I think one of the top performing ones was uh, retention um, and sort of increasing repeat purchase. So I'll probably focus on, on those two to sort of tie it back to what people are asking about and uh, putting in that poll. Um, so first and second purchase is probably one of the first ones. Um, we can all appreciate the budget getting tighter and CPA is getting more expensive. Um, something we're really helping our clients do is looking at making sure they don't have a database full of single purchases. Um, using the first and second purchase model, we typically find that roughly about 27% of customers on a client platform uh, has a potential to make a second purchase when just left alone completely. Um, so it's really about identifying people and helping them increase this further, um, but not just waiting for it to happen naturally. It's about identifying and then targeting them. That's, that's what our AI model does there. So it identifies those people that are likely to make a second purchase and then allows us to target them sooner. Um, and do do sort of the, rather than using a manual campaign it allows us to do a sort of an automated program that just targets people at the point when they are likely to make a second purchase and try and decrease that time lag between first to second purchase um, by doing so we've seen increases around repeat purchase going for uh, to 45 percent to make another purchase after a second and then 54 percent more likely after a third purchase so it's really helping increase that that sort of a repeat purchase level for our clients. Um, I said I'll talk about retention. So um, another application that we're helping our clients achieve is around sort of like customer retention, where AI is helping us identify those likely to churn or lapse. Um, we typically use this again as an automated program in the lead up to an event um, when someone is likely to lapse or has a potential to. 
Um, we see it creating far more accurate than sort of a business dictating um, sort of the, the logic and using a standard logic for everybody on sort of a database. Um, by doing this, we typically see sort of a, uh, a far greater performance um, when we're treating every customer individually um, who are purchasing at different points rather than using, say, uh, 12 months after initial purchase is when we typically see people lapsing, for example. So it's really individual amazing. Yeah. Um, All Beauty, when they use this model, saw an increase of over 500% in the lapsing campaign's performance when using AI. So it really has some great benefits um, when using it, even on some of those sort of simple, simple levels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I said, well, say simple levels, but their marketing goals, which are quite chunky there to try and attain. But yeah, some great sort of example applications there. And then, so I suppose, yeah, some of the, the applications, and we talked about, you know, some of the uh, the revenue areas that, um, you know, that brands can benefit off, you know, for example, the, the 500 pound, 500 percent increase in revenue. But the marketer also gets some benefits, don't they, James, in terms of things yeah. like time savings or, or anything like that? Yeah, going back to what we started on earlier, but time saving is a massive one. So it frees people up to work mm -hmm. on content or projects or whatever it might be that supports the campaigns. Um, it, it basically saves time by giving you the data selection rather than you having to think, uh, work out a life cycle of when to target people. Uh, that tandemly goes in with greater performance, you just mentioned there, so revenue growth. Um, and making that sort of a lot more easier for the selection process that's looking at the objective or the desired output. Um, and then last but not least, it's it's cheaper. So it's it's more cost effective when doing things in this way because it improves your CPA um, and retention levels on sort of your platform overall. So those are the, those are the main ones that we typically see with clients. Yeah, exactly. Who wants wouldn't want to do things smarter, more efficiently, more at scale? You know, as we, as we covered earlier. Um, so obviously there are a couple of great examples I said around retention. Um, but Andrew, I think do you you have some examples or you've worked on projects around? Um, customer lifetime value as well, haven't you? Which is another key uh, marketing goal. Yeah, I think so. Look, um, I think the I know quite a lot of people have talked about you know acquiring and and getting repeat purchase around where we need to get to. And ultimately, if you don't acquire customers and get them to make that first repeat purchase, you're not going to have any customer lifetime value anyway. So it's the first stages of where you need to get to. Um, ultimately, what you're really trying to think about though is is how do you get customers you, you, there's almost a there's a model that you can write which is for every customer you acquire how many of them will do a, a a first repeat a second repeat and a third one and when when i was working at actually probably at tesco sainsbury's asda all the all the retailers who had a, a home shopping service you were very clear on how you build customer lifetime value because actually a customer would would do the first uh, shop on a grocery home shopping and then a second and you knew how many of them would get to four shops and once they'd done four shops that was effectively how how you know they'd be there they'd be doing it forever sort of thing that was four and they're in is probably a good way of describing it so what we spent a lot of time doing was thinking about how we could identify the most relevant people to do the first shop mm -hmm. and then and then as James said you you coax people through to those other sort of areas but then we then we develop having developed that bit of technology and, and program, we then said, right, how do you create the ones that have got the most lifetime value, i.e., who will who will be still with you in a year or two years' time in lots of different areas there? And and what AI enabled us to do was was understand almost instantly where we, people were going and give them the right level, the right bit of activity when they were coming back to it. So actually what we moved from was if you could just if you could imagine in your head a load of marketeers with spears who were going around stabbing and acquiring a customer we were hunting customers okay in lots of different areas um and we'd hunt them and they'd fall and we'd drag them back and we'd tick them on our list sort of thing but actually where, where we evolved to is we actually started farming our customer base so we'd actually move move from being a hunter to a farmer which an, an ai enabled you to do to understand what customers had done if they if they'd done something that morning you could respond almost straight away uh, with, with something that they could that would give them a relevant piece of activity and that that farming mentality driven by ai ai enabled you to to sort of grow customer lifetime value exponentially in terms of what you need to do so ai gives you this mindset of you can move from being a hunter to being a farmer 
and and you can do it because as as James said you know it automates the boring things you can think about what are the most relevant things gives you more thinking time and it saves you money which is the most important thing around where you need to get to um, yeah. and, and deliver your business course but but you know the really simple thing is you know it just it can move so quickly if you can imagine it going back to um you know the the sort of john you know the 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 uh, the market stall mentality if you know your customers you can make really good approaches this allows you to scale up and and, and pace up in a way that you've never seen before and it, and almost the, the way to do it is to sort of work through the journeys and, and add one module in at a time so you might do a okay, how do we acquire the right customers first how do we get the right customers to do a second sort of and then you add in levels of different programs that go into it as you're going forward mm-hmm. and, and you and you start in a way and i i've got a sort of i have a you know you think of a baby baby doesn't get up unless actually one of my daughters did she, she stood up and ran straight away but very few of them do that you crawl and then you walk and then you run and then you fly and that's the journey you've got to go through when you're building ai into your marketing program you you crawl to begin with you learn a few things you implement them you then walk and then you run and then by you know within six months or a year you can be flying which is great exactly i think that's with just business growth in general actually because you know you were talking about farming then and a lot of people said their you know biggest sort of goal was acquisition well actually you know obviously it depends on what stage your business is at but actually you know you can probably gain you know just as much or even more success by your retention sort of campaigns but it's not mm. just you know trying to re-engage everybody and drive repeat purchases from everybody it's how ai can help you be smarter to retain and farm as you were saying the right customers isn't it because you know some customers will just purchase with you once or you know or, or jump around so that's how ai can really then help you like to farm those right ones isn't it and, and take those steps in the uh, and people are quite savvy now. They know when they're being hunted. <laughs> they do, don't they? You you have it, don't you? There's you just know all those things. So if you can find a way of building that emotional relationship with them yeah. in a relevant way, as in a that, that's where the science and the art of marketing comes together in terms yeah. of what you're doing and and relevant. If the customer I, benefits. Just as important as the message. Go on, sorry. If the customer benefits, they don't mind. I think as long yeah. as they see a benefit and as long as they are aware that their data is being handled appropriately, safely, it's 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 great. And that journey you describe, it's a really good journey there. Depending on how long it takes and depending how long the competition is doing, it might actually be a leapfrog because they might be leapfrogging the competition. They might be doing it over a three month or even a year's period in that time. Others might be quite static and they might be leapfrogging the competition, you know, and, and eroding their market share. Well, yeah. I, I, you are right, and and everybody's got to be really clear where they can um, add, add. When when you want to develop something that's your capability, it's got to be something that's really really critical to you. So I don't know whether you've all heard the story of Uber. So basically, when Uber set up, they said, right, what's the most important thing that we have to develop? Um, oh, and it was their pricing model. Okay, so how do you price a ride? So they developed that. Basically, everything else they outsourced. They basically went to everyone else. They went to Microsoft, they went to, uh, and they said, right, we'll give you a bit of our business and in shares, but you give us this product. But we, but they developed. So if from a marketing perspective, you're really clear what you are, re- has to be really critical for your business. Mm. Apart from that, go beg, steal, and borrow, because someone has probably done it before already. Yeah. Be lazy, find someone, find someone else that's already done it and learn quickly is probably the best way, the advice I've always, and that's what, you know, that's what I've always done throughout my career. Find someone else that's done it and do it quickly. You know, it's the easiest way of getting things done is really, is is don't, don't learn yourself. Find someone who knows how to do it and learn it, which is why you're on this webinar, I suppose. (laughs) <laughs> you need to get to, to the, yeah, tech partners or whoever around you. So, um, exactly so just right. to, to the, uh, the final stretch now. So just to remind people, if you do have any questions uh, for any panelists, like I said, enter them in. I think there should be, like I said, a question mark and speech bubble on the right hand side. And obviously we should have a few minutes at the end to sort of get through any of those. But 
So, you know, like I said, we've covered, you know, a, a lot today in terms of applications, benefits, myths, but I think what's really interesting as a sort of a final question for the panel really is it's onto the future. So actually, you know, what does the, the future look like, you know, and, you know, our panelists don't have crystal balls, but I'm sure it'd be really, really good to sort of get their opinion in terms of, you know, what is the future of AI? So um, James, actually, if we, we start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's going to start moving into channel delivery selection. So less about the actual uh, who to target and more about what to target them with. I think there's a big gap and an opportunity there. Um, a lot of people say that they are a multi-channel and omni-channel, but I don't think anyone's really doing it well still. Um, it's, it's massively complex. Um, customer identification, each touch point is typically still quite siloed. Um, especially when you're looking at sort of an online to a store presence, when you've got that sort of multiple store location and ways to purchase. At the end of the day, the customer doesn't really care. So they don't care ultimately about this. Um, but I think something that is going to come over time is that whoever cracks this well is going to get a very good head start. And I think that's where we're going to see AI start to sort of expand in the next few years. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And then Katie, what's uh, your opinion and insight? So it all depends on the time frame, doesn't it? future do we mean the near future a couple of years i think we'll start to see more scale in the next two three five years that will have a big impact that, that will depend on um the industry sector you know there are some like retail and financial services are a bit further ahead and others are you know slower to respond um if we jump forward a bit more then you know we are looking at certain technologies that will make AI even more powerful. I'm thinking of GPT-3, you know, our ability to really get hyper-personalization and to create content campaigns that will trigger you to have, you know, make purchases because, because it will really entice you in and, and, and we will be, you know, to some extent manipulated, but we should benefit. So uh, I, I think we'll see more focus on ethics and more regulation coming in to, to manage what's happening out there in here but i think i would envisage more and more vendors maybe one or two of the big vendors that will make it almost like a suite of products so it will be so easy to to use but you know i think you have to start from the point of view of what's the business goal do your due diligence go out there and talk to people like you know red eye and, and make sure that you can find a solution to those needs and start small and then make that same scale and upskill your team and educate your people i think more and more organizations across all sectors will be doing that in the coming one two three years thank you katie okay and then andrew finally your um, thoughts. I, I think it's going to be basically uh more for less is probably a good summary so there's going to be more ai um, more adoption and it's going to cost less <laughs> it's as simple as that it, and, and it it will be we've we've seen exponential growth since 2007 when the the iPhone was the thing that really made the change in terms mm -hmm. of the data that was available and that was in that was only in 2007 that was 15 years ago so you've seen exponential growth and and you can quite easily see and that exponential growth is going to continue um, and so I, I've got no idea what's going to happen in the next mm -hmm. five years um, but all I do know is it's going to there's going to be more of it there's going to be more adoption you know my my mother who's 84 now will quite happily talk to alexa you know and get her you know who would have thought she'd never have, she doesn't even know who alexa is she calls her she calls her a racer or sometimes so i don't know she calls her different <laughs> but she but 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 alexa has learned to when she's called a racer to to just you know so any, so i think it's good isn't it? yeah more more adoption more ai less cost less moving forward yeah exactly and now i agree and I, I think like we were sort of saying you know like i said a key takeaway from me from what all you guys have gone through today is that you know like you were just saying the investment in this in ai is only going forward you know it's not going backwards we're only sort of getting more sophisticated more investment into it so it really you know those forward thinking marketers you know that it really should be something that they're sort of thinking about and, and reviewing now for the business that they work in um, and as you know you were just touching on there um, Andrew you know the, the younger generation that come into the purchasing age as well not just you know maybe 
the older generation are, are starting to be a bit more digitally savvy the younger generation are just digitally native you know they expect brands to be digital seamless virtual and, and you know i think we covered a bit earlier that you know actually if you're not and you're not then differentiating differentiating yourself as a brand and, mm. and stepping out then actually they, they won't buy with you they won't purchase with you you know they, they will let, they will let you know that you know you're not the brand that's you know moving ahead with the times as they say so yes i think some great, great points but again from me to, to really sort of hammer home then to sort of the listeners you know the, the benefits you know as we've got this far more abundance of data than ever before to really as a marketer to be able to sort of effectively scale personalizations to drive better campaigns and customer experiences and to do that efficiently accurately and at scale is going to be very difficult if not impossible without the application of ai however small or large so you know to really grow and hit those marketing goals and be successful um you know it's something that needs to be sort of you know part of your uh, conversation now and obviously that's also where you know the likes of red eye we have you know we have over 25 years experience and sort of we you know we're continually sort of innovating our platform to be more ai driven um, as well as helping our clients on that journey you know we have a unique set of predictive models that sort of work across to sort of maximize the output across the whole customer life cycle so they work on top of your data again to just help you as a marketer work smarter work more efficiently and obviously work more successfully to hit your marketing goals which i'm sure we'll all agree anything that's going to help us achieve that is something that's interesting so well that's it for today then um we haven't had actually oh we have just had one question i think has come through um so let me take a read of that one and we'll try and get some of those answered okay so Ah, so we've got one actually from a red eye perspective, which I think hopefully I might have actually just covered. And it was basically how does red eye sort of cater for the different sort of needs um, and what are the sort of the marketing solutions we get out of it. So I have sort of covered as a red eye perspective, we have predictive models, which obviously help you maximize areas across the customer lifecycle and they're applied on top of your data. And again, they just work to become more accurate with the machine learning, the more data that you have and the longer that you implement them. And obviously just the more success that you can gain by things like I said, just making sure that you're growing and retaining the right customers and finding which one of those might be more likely to be a VIP, which you're gonna get greater customer lifetime value from. All areas like that, again, just to work a bit smarter and then things like that. But um, we can definitely get in touch with you after if you were finding, uh, wanted a little bit more information about that too. So there isn't any more questions that have actually come through. Um, so I was wrap up basically and say thank you to everybody that's listening you know i hope you found this today's panel uh, interesting and it's provided some food for thought um, and then thank you very much to our panelists who've shared some insights so thank you all thanks very much thank you pleasure yeah. okay yeah have a nice rest of your day thank guys you thank you bye-bye thanks everyone <laughs> bye-bye